we've been singing about going forth to tell the good news. About bowing down and confessing. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me inside out. You know when I rise. You know when I come in and when I go out. Your love, your eyes are around me all the time. <clears throat> and Father God, this morning we want to just pause for a minute in our busy lives and look up into your eyes and say thank you for watching me. Thank you for all you give me. And Lord, this morning as we listen to your words written, written by Isaiah, stuck in Jerusalem as he was, worrying about being exported to Babylon. Words of hope. As we hear to words from Matthew about what belongs to you and what belongs to Caesar, the government, or anything else in our possession. So help us, Lord, to work out in our minds what you're calling us to do, who you're calling us to be, and how. As we think together. Amen. Amen. So, Jim, believe my side. From Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1 to 7, from the New International Version. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose, hand, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him, and to strip kings of their armour, to open doors before him so the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me there is no God. I will strengthen you though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Mike, for the denarius on the screen. <laughs> Brilliant. How have I arrived? <laughs> we'll hear about it in our second reading in a minute. The denarius is, is interesting, really, because it was, it was ten, ten asses. Um, an ass, A-S. Is a single coin, a little bronze coin, which is like a penny, I suppose. Um, but the, the denarius, which is worth ten of those asses, <laughs> um, is actually a, 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 um, a silver coin. And we still use them today because we talk about our money in terms of um, pound, shilling, and pence, don't we? And what's the short for pound, shilling, and pence? LSD. L. Pounds, S shillings, and D denarius. 
yes. So it's look how they work today. Interesting. Anyway, we're going to um, have a hymn. <laughs> Jesus, put this song into our hearts. So the denarius, yes, about a day's wages um, for a normal worker in the time. Not nothing, quite a lot of money, quite a lot of money. Um, the denarius and Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, Meso, between, middle of, Potamos, the rivers, Mesopotamia is the land between the Tigris and the Euphrates as they run down towards the Gulf of Iran and um, the, Gulf, the Gulf beyond. And um, Mesopotamia was a very fertile land because the rivers, the big rivers, ran all the way down there from the north down towards the south, southwest, south, southeast. And the two rivers watered the lands and they were really, really fertile. And so it was called the end of the Fertile Crescent. Do you remember the maps of, of um, 
the, the Near East Fertile Crescent. It starts in the rivers here, up the rivers, uh, towards the top of the, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and over into Assyria, and then comes down to the Mediterranean coast, a narrow bit, in between is this, the deserts of Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. over here, Mesopotamia, over the top through Assyria, down to Israel, this mm -hmm. narrow gap, very narrow gap, between the desert pushing in from the, the other side of the Jordan to the, the, the Mediterranean, uh, by Jaffa and Haifa and Tel Aviv. And then down to Egypt, and Egypt, of course, was the, the, the Nile flowed into Egypt up for many, many miles, and watered the lands in the Nile Delta was again really fertile. So this area from the Nile Delta, right through Israel, a little narrow a bit, round through Assyria and down this great valley in Mesopotamia, the, the area of two rivers, that was called the Fertile Crescent. All around it was desert or mountains. And the Fertile Crescent was the heart of civilization um, for many, many, many years, in fact, centuries, before, right, even before Genghis Khan was in from, from, the, from, the, from China. And the Fertile Crescent was there, from Egypt, e Egypt, as you look at it, round to the, the Mesopotamia. Fascinating area. And that was the area where Cyrus came in. We heard about Cyrus in the first reading from Isaiah. Cyrus came from, from further east still, from Persia. He was the king of Persia and of the Medes. And the Medes were that northern area where Assyria was, the top of the Fertile Crescent. A bit in the Crescent and a bit on the mountains. So the Medes were, were, were soon conquered by, by um, Cyrus. And Cyrus, who was king of, of, of Persia, went up north to conquer the Medes. He conquered, in fact, his, his empire um, was huge. It went from the Aegean Sea to the Indus Valley in India. It was the largest empire for, for many, many, many centuries in the, in the science. In 500 BC, uh, he, he formed, well, in 530, he invaded Jerusalem. And he came from Mesopotamia over into Jerusalem because it was, a, it was part of the Fertile Crescent. Why wouldn't you? He couldn't go across the desert, had to go around through Assyria to get there because the way across the desert was just too hard, just too hard. And people would die on the way, and half the army would be lost. So the Fertile Crescent was the route to go. And then down the King's Highway. The King's Highway went right through Jerusalem, from Egypt up towards the north, up towards Nablus, and then didn't go down to the Fertile Crescent, did it? It probably should have done. So the King's Highway was there, and that was in Solomon David's time. So quite a, quite a area of the world, which is fascinating. And Cyrus, Cyrus the Great, they called him. In fact, 1971 and 1972, for some reason, was called the Year of Cyrus the Great. Well, for some reason, it was, it was 2,500 years since Cyrus the Great had formed his empire. And, and uh, in 530, 539 or so before that, BC. Um, so Sarah, that was the era of Cyrus the Great. And uh, when Cyrus was in, he came from, from, from Persia to the Media, and king of the Medes and Persians. He then came down into the Fertile Crescent, where he found Babylon. And thought, hmm, here's a tasty one. Right in the middle of the, of the um, Mesopotamian area, the fertile area, Babylon. Babylon was actually on the Euphrates, nearer to Israel, Tigris, a bit further east. But um, Babylon was a place of great wealth. Uh, you may have heard of the, the hanging gardens of Babylon and the Psalms when the Jews were taken over to Babylon, they were crying for the beauty of the city and the, their loss of Jerusalem. And Babylon was way better than Jerusalem. But then, when, then Jerusalem was home, you know, there were no hanging gardens in Jerusalem. But Babylon was a very, very famous place. Very famous. Very wealthy. And Cyrus, of course, took it. And he, he moved his, his um, center to, to Babylon. Do you know how he took it? Well, I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> um, the, the, the Euphrates River is huge. 
And he came along with his army, and he, 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 he couldn't take Babylon, it couldn't be taken. It was really well defended, really well defended, all around. The walls of Babylon and the hanging gardens inside the walls were famed throughout the known world at the time. So he, he couldn't go up and just march, so they'd, they'd shoot him down, they'd, they'd fire from the tops, and he couldn't get in there. Once he got in, he could probably conquer the place, but he couldn't get into it. So what did he do? He thought, the Euphrates goes through Babylon. Mm. Can't get down the Euphrates. They'd see me coming. It's, um, it's ships, I can't, they, they, they just burn them, they'd shoot them down. At. No good. So what did he do? He built a dam, he redirected the whole Euphrates about 10 miles to, to the west, towards the Tigris. And when the river was flowing around uh, Babylon and not through it, he just marched down in the night and took the city. On, on the, on, it must have got a bit soggy in the bottom, I suppose, but they, they, had, they had to do it. They couldn't wait long for it to dry out. That's how he did it. Redirected the three fridges and, and took Babylon. And then he put the Euphrates back. <laughs> he, <laughs> there's a cylinder called the Cyrus Cylinder, which mm -hmm. is in the British Museum. And it's, it's, a, it's a sort of roundish, sort of fat, fat, of one end, fat in the middle and the ends. What do you call that shape? Sort of oval without ends or something like that. <laughs> it's, um, it's only about, it's less than a foot long. When you see it on pictures, you think, gosh, what a huge cylinder this is. It's the Cyrus Cylinder. It's one of the greatest finds ever made in Babylon. It was found there and dug up in 19, 1887, I think, by some famous archaeologist. And he, he discovered this little cylinder. And it contains all of Cyrus's um, identification marks, who he was, where he came from. Called himself the King of the Universe. Well, he probably was at the time. <laughs> this is in 539. He, he, he came in and he conquered Jerusalem and brought this the cylinder we, we left in Babylon, I suppose. But the cylinder is terribly famous and it contains all these demands and, and the way he was going to rule. And he was very, I don't mean he was a kind, but he was thoughtful. And Babylon was full of people whom the Babylonians had conquered and, and sucked all their people into the city. And he sent them all home. And it, when, when he sent people home to their gods and to their cities, he would send their gods with them. And if the people who, if his predecessors, Sennacherib and other guys who had been the head of Babylon before, when they went and conquered people, they trashed their whole city and, and took their gods away because they wanted the gods to come with them. And they, the gods would be made from stone or wood or something. And Cyrus would have all these gods remade. When he came to the Jews, they didn't have any god, which was very strange for him. Because he thought, well, what can they do? Because they haven't got a god. How do, make, how do, I, how do my god make, make them a god? And he couldn't do it. So he, he researched what the Jews had been worshipping and how and where. And they had the temple. And of course the temple had been destroyed when they'd been attacked by Mark or somebody. And, uh, and so he went to rebuild the temple and the walls around it, as it had been, as they wanted it to be done. And he sent the people home to worship their god in their temple. He couldn't quite work it out what they were doing or where the god was, but he didn't worry about that. That wasn't his, his problem. That was their problem. And they solved that years ago. So that was Cyrus, and he was he was a great king, a great emperor of the of the, the huge empire which he controlled. So Isaiah is writing about Cyrus. He refers to him in, this, in, the, in chapter forty-five. This is what the Lord says to his anointed. Now, the anointed is the Messiah. The anointed is the liberator. And he calls Cyrus, Isaiah, calls Cyrus the Messiah. Mm, strange. The only place, the only place in the whole Bible where the word anointed or Messiah is used for anything, not a Jewish leader. Or Christ. What Christ means Messiah, isn't it? 
So this, so he's saying to this Cyrus is the Christ. He's going to come and liberate us and set us free and give us our, our life the way we want to live it, the way God wants it to be. That's huge. What a thing to call him. But he was, what he meant was that he will be our liberator. He'll be, the, perhaps it's a lessened version of the word um, Messiah um, in, in Hebrew. But it's, that's the only time it's used for anybody else. And so th that's how great he thought Cyrus was and how and he knew, he was aware, presumably, of the way he was, Cyrus had been re-establishing the countries which he'd taken. They would obey him, they would keep his rules, but he would respect their faiths and their, their freedoms and their cities and their rights. So, Cyrus the one then goes before God and strip kings of their army to open doors before him. Gates will not be shut, I will go before you. I will level the mountains. Big news. So dear old Cyrus, he was a powerful man, very powerful man. And he was the one who was going to rebuild and re-establish the, the heart of Jerusalem. So he went and did all that. <clears throat> and he ruled, as I said, from the Aegean to the Indus River. So why did they put that in with the, with the denarius in Matthew 22? And this time when Jesus was toying with a coin. And they'd asked him, they come to trap him. He, he says suddenly those words, why have you come to trap me? He could see exactly what they were doing. And who was doing the trapping? The Pharisees and somebody else. The Herodians. I thought you might have picked it up and went through. <laughs> the Pharisees and the Herodians. Now, in Jesus' time, you would not see a Pharisee and a Herodian talking. You would not see them walk down the street together. You would never see a Pharisee dirty his, his law, his purity before God by talking to a Herodian. He wouldn't, it would never happen. The Herodians were followers of Herod. They believed Caesar was God, and Herod was put in his place to work to, to, to rule them. And they were powerful, a lot of them, because if you wanted to win the favor of the Roman, the Roman invaders, you had to be a Herodian. If you're any kind of a politician, you would be Herodian. And the Pharisees couldn't stand them. The Pharisees did not want them to be there. They wanted God to rule his country and the people to follow him. So why? How? I, I cannot work out how the Pharisees and the Herodians got together to come and pose this question. They must both have been so cross with Jesus and so keen to, to, to trap him somehow, to shut him up that they, were, they would even come together on this occasion. The Pharisees and the Herodians came to Jesus and asked him. <laughs> crazy, 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 crazy. We know that you are come from God. We know that you are a man of integrity. You teach the word of God in accordance with the truth. Well, the Pharisees were big on the truth, but the Herodians couldn't get tuppence on the truth. How is it they came together on this occasion to ask this question? It's fascinating to try to envisage what the matter would be. How they might have got together in the first place and what they had to achieve by it. And that's why afterwards, I suppose, everybody was amazed. They were probably amazed to see these guys both questioning Jesus together. But even more amazed by his answer, with the denarius we had up before, that this coin, Jesus said, go and fetch the coin. Should we pay this imperial tax or not? The tax, the imperial, Roman imperial, sorry, empire's tax would, um, it, it, no Roman would, would pay it. Paul never paid that tax. Paul was a Roman citizen. Um, but anybody who wasn't a Roman citizen, anybody who had been conquered by Rome and, and subjugated to be um, a people ruled from Rome, they would pay the tax. Mm -hmm. They would pay the empire's tax, the imperial tax, to 
to, to the Caesar, to Caesar. So Caesar's head was on the coin as he saw beautifully. And, um, and the denarius was the tax they had to pay. But at a day's wages, as I said. So what was the what were they trying to achieve by asking him this question? And he must have thought of it when he said uh, he wouldn't have a denarius on him. Of course he wouldn't. He had the, the, the Jews wanted their coinage. Um, if, if, if the Romans had forced the, the um, Jews to pay shekels in their, for their tax, that would have been interesting. But of course Jesus couldn't have, couldn't have this, this, um, this engagement here with them. He couldn't have made the point he's going to make now about this coin, this, this denarius. The, this day's wages. <coughs> I didn't know the story, we read it. And whose face is here? Julius Caesar's face is here. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's. And, people, and they were amazed by, by his answer. How clever, how thoughtful, how simple. Sorry, it's a chapter parcel. <coughs> <laughs> uh, so we owe to God what is God's, and we should give to God what is God's. And so the obvious question is, okay, what is God's? What did he mean? What are we supposed to give to God? How do you give things to God? Not real things? Give to God what is God's. We give him worship. Is that the primary thing? It probably is. We've all come here this morning to, to offer God worship. And the word for worship, which Jesus used, was pros kunio, pros kunio, to worship. It's the Greek word. Pros, towards, and kunio comes from the word kusi. And you may not guess that kusi means to kiss. So, to move towards, to kiss. Like you move towards your friend, or to your wife, or to your husband, uh, whatever, or anybody if you like. <laughs> but you move towards them to give them a kiss. That, that's the kind of um, theme, the kind of idea contained in the word proscunium. And the idea of worship. You want to move to God, towards God, to worship Him. Um, in many churches, people want to raise their hands. Mm -hmm when they want to worship God. And you can see why, because I want to trying to move towards them. If you move towards somebody to give them a kiss, you're going to put your hands out. And, and people often, as I say, raise their hands when they want to worship God. Because they have some think, OK, I'm, do, I'm doing this towards God. Because you can't literally prosecute in front of God. You can't give somebody a kiss, give God a kiss. I mean, I can give you a kiss. And you give me one, but, but I can't give God one because they haven't got a cheek or a name to kiss. Nothing to do. Nothing there. It's, it's all in the mind, it's all in, in, in desire. So you want it, so you lift your hands, you, you put your hands out, whatever. People do when they worship. Proscunium. So, what do you want to give to God? I worship. We give our love. Whatever he's given us, the gifts we have, we can sing or we can't sing, we can talk or we can't talk, we can help out, make tea and coffee or we can't or whatever. We do what we can do, our life. Commitment. Commitment. We want to give God not just a part of our lives, not just a bit of maybe half an hour, an hour on Sunday mornings, not just, but it's all of our lives we want to give him. Commitment. Prayers. We give him our prayers and our worship. I suppose obedience. We can give obedience. We spent a couple of weeks in Japan in, in the end of August, in the end of September. And uh, what a, an obedient people. People used to say, now how is it that these, these people from Japan are so kind and, and so lovely and so helpful all the time? And you think, well, we, we know about people in the, in the war in Japan, people who are from Japan. 
they did terrible things to people. Well, we did terrible things. Everyone did terrible things to people in the war. But I suppose if they were told to do these things by the emperor, they would obey. They're a very obedient society. And we, we tend to, if, if, it, if the light's going to go green, and it hasn't quite gone green yet, and nobody's coming, we tend to cross over. And we don't tend to feel we need to wait for the light to change too much. And I kept doing this, across the roads in Japan, and Mike said to me, Mike, my son who lives there, Dad, not, no, that's a gaijin smash. A gaijin is a tourist, a <coughs> foreigner, and smash is a bad thing to do. <laughs> you can't do that, you mustn't do it. You mustn't go across before the light changes. We don't do that in Japan. We wait. <laughs> and they do. They all wait. <laughs> Every time. And even if there's nobody coming, they still wait. It's a tiny road, a big road, doesn't matter which. They all wait until it goes. And then they can go. So a very obedient society. Amazing. We want to give God our obedience, I suppose. And do what we should do all the time. We should learn from the Japanese here. Do it properly. Life well lived. Let's give God that. Our care. All kinds of things. I suppose it means all in the end our worship, isn't it? They were amazed at Jesus' answer. Here's the coin. Whose face is this? Whose inscription is this? Caesar's. Well, give to God what is Caesar's. And give, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And give to God Proscunia. So Jesus are you changing me day by day, hour by hour?
Jesus, you are changing me. You are changing me. Little by little, day by day. And Jesus, I long that you would make me more like you. we pray for our own lives and we pray for our world we long that same thing may our lives more and more reflect your nature we think Lord of the aid the 20 lorries that rolled into for crossing in, into Gaza, mm. carrying aid and carrying coffins. Mm. Lord, how much we long. You were there. You've even been to Gaza. You went through Gaza on the way to the coast. It was in Gaza, Lord, you healed that little boy. It was in Gaza the men let down someone who was ill, some roof. The roof is so damaged now, we see them just block upon block destroyed. The Lord you walked in those places. Won't they reflect your love? Won't they forgive? Won't they find a way to make peace? We read that the aid is a drop in the ocean. Dear Father God, there's so many places in the world where people cannot agree. But they cannot live in one life. They're not able to even attempt it. Dear Father God, we, we thank you for some of the joy, some of the relief when the Ukrainians managed to break through over the Dnieper River in Kaviv and to establish permanent sites on the East Bank. Thank you, Lord, for the hope that they experience. The prayer will go on. And then in Poland, next door to Ukraine in Poland, the young people, young voters, people who can vote for the first time in their lives, have driven out the party from the right and they've lost their power in Poland and Lord we pray that for the future so uncertain, so different for so many people and we ask Lord in our prayers that that your nature might be seen in, in some of the leaders and some of the people who may take example from you and that forgiveness and generosity might creep into people's lives. And Lord, in Gaza itself and in, in the West Bank, there's such hurt, such violence. Attacks, <coughs> attacks, dear Lord. We pray nearer to home too for Storm Babbitt and all the havoc that's been wreaking up and down the country. Trains cancelled. People standing on platforms waiting, wondering, will there be a train Monday? All this damage in Scotland and 
little uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow and play. So lo and behold, these people, our own countrymen here facing the storms, the people in Kiev and in the Ukraine, the people in Poland, so many people in the surrounding world. And the whole continents of people, Africa and South America, North America and people struggling to be your people and those who don't have a clue <coughs> what your message is. So dear Father God, we offer you these people and we ask for your spirit to seep into their lives, to show them a hope where before they had none. May the way of love they know so well in their own families and their own lives leak into their politics as well. And dear Lord, we thank you for our own country and for our lives here. Thank you for Bobby Charlton, Lord, seeing his comb over flapping in the wind and, and he, he gave so much. Thank you for him and for his life and for so many people who've died recently. Argentina. <coughs> Dear Father God, we, we hold in our hand our world before you, our own lives, our own longings, our own understanding of what it means to be more like you day by day. Jesus, you are changing me. Jesus, you are changing me. Shall we say together the words that Jesus taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Let us just say, my favorite bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive the best of trespasses, and lead us not into temptation, but to live with us from evil.
May God's blessing be with us. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. May He fill us and inspire us and make us more like Jesus every day. Amen. Amen. Amen.